coming up. Track Talk with Lucas Degrassi. A new boss at Next EV. And reliving race three. Here comes Mitch Evans oh, on the attack. Get out of the way. Now, in the last episode, we showed you that when it comes to overtaking, there's no one better than Lucas Degrassi. The App Schaefer driver has made an incredible 80 passes in Formula E, including two more in Buenos Aires. So, who better to give a lesson in learning the track? So the difficulty of Formula E is that you have one hour and 15 minutes to learn a new track. And that's why you have to do a lot of preparation on the simulator. So on the simulator, the main focus is on the race mode, which is the energy management level. We have to understand in which corner is the best to lift and to save energy. So you optimize your lap time and you optimize your race distance. Even with all this information, still you have to do the track walk. You can feel the track, you can feel the tarmac change, you can feel all the camber difference, you can feel all the difference in surface, and that has a big influence on how the car behaves. The other things we look in the track walk is the, let's say, the safe zones, place where even if you do a slightly mistake or if you try a more aggressive overtake, you can still run off without losing your race, you'll still be able to turn your car around and go back. Another thing that we look deep into the simulator and in the track walk is the overtaking points, of course. So you have to look uh, where the longest straight leads to normally the slowest point of the track. If the track is wide enough. Oh, look at this. Wide here. Yes, he's on the inside line as well. And Adam Carroll's the meat in the sandwich. If you can go inside, and if you do go inside, how much margin you have um, to do the corner side by side with your opponent. And one of the most important things that people don't realize, you have different types of tarmac. And because tarmac and tire, they work together, the, the car changes behavior as the tarmac changes. You have a part which is in concrete, another part which is in a very flat tarmac, and then another part with a very bumpy tarmac. So the car keeps changing as the lap goes around. Uh, and that has uh, only an influence that only in free practice, only driving the car you can feel. You cannot replicate that into the simulator and into the preparation. Go-kart racetrack doesn't really matter because racing from go-kart to Formula E to Le Mans to Formula One, it's all about the same technique. It's about preparation, it's about extracting the maximum out of the car in a given track. So thank you for watching and I hope these tips will make you faster and better. I'm sure they will. Whilst Lucas Degrassi is an expert at overtaking, race three of the season had actually begun with the Brazilian in the unfamiliar position of starting pole for the first time. Now, someone else in unfamiliar territory is the new team principal for Next EV. Following the untimely death of Dr. Martin Leach back in November from cancer, Jerry Hughes is now the man in charge of restoring the fortunes of the team who guided Nelson Piquet Jr. to the title in season one. And we go green in London. Oh, and a spin. Boemi spins. The potential leader. championship leader. Piquet's through. Piquet's got past Salvador Duran. Am I on the temperature? <laughs> By our calculations, you have me. We tried so hard. Oh, my God. I cannot believe it. Well, there's been a, a transition. The circumstances of uh, previous team principal passing away um, has meant there was a, an opportunity for somebody else to step into uh, Martin's shoes. Martin had a very wide and diverse array of skills, everything from engineering through to running large organisations. Uh, I've been the acting team principal effectively from uh, Hong Kong, uh, now into the third race event of, of season three, so I can only hope to build on the experience I've gained so far in motorsport and to learn as quickly as I can do in areas where I've had no prior experience. He came fastest of all by 13 hundreds of a second. A first career pole for Nelson Piquet Jr. It is Nelson Piquet who leads and his teammate Oliver Turb in second place. Piquet the, the leader. is the race leader. He's gone straight yeah. in the barriers at the no. chicane. Down to third place. It's all about preparation. Um, whether that be the driver, in the, the, the driver in the loop simulator, whether it be us running simulations. It is becoming even more competitive uh, and, and locking in on a good result on Saturday afternoon uh, there's a very low statistical probability of that happening. 
But there's Nelson Piquet. He's going to be starting in fifth place on the grid. Oliver Turvey, he will start in fourth place. Look at Oliver Turvey. He's setting up Lucas Degrassi for turn four. This next corner, yep, pulled out. Here he comes then, up the inside, and he gets it job done on the brakes. When things go to plan, that's quite easy to execute. And a oh, big <laughs> lock up from Turvey. Did he even make the corner? A little bit close, just about makes it out. And goodness me, Degrassi coming right out in front of Nelson Piquet. When things don't go to plan, that's when you have to combine elements of experience, knowledge, um, perhaps maybe what you've done before that's either worked well at one circuit or not at another. And they've all managed to leapfrog Oliver Turvey. Fifth place is Nelson Piquet Jr. First and foremost, you have to have the chain of command, you have to have good levels of communication within your team, and above all, you have to remain calm. Myself and my colleagues designed the car uh, in very difficult and unusual circumstances, and so it's been a great start. What we need to do now is build on those foundations, and we need to build on the performance of the car and effectively the result. So still more progress to be made at Next EV, but let's see how the other teams got on as we take a cinematic look back at race three. Radio check, radio check. Radio check. Radio okay. All five lights are on. And we go green in Buenos Aires. Who's going to get a good start? Buemi's got away pretty decently. Yeah, we said, Can Buemi out break Jean Eric Verne into turn one? Flat out, flat out, go flat out. One, five, seven, you can push a bit more. Throwing the cars in pretty much flat out. Here comes Mitch Evans oh, oh, oh. on the attack. The Jaguar, get out of the way. Verne into the lead of the race. Here comes Pross. Pross going up the inside of Nelson Piquet Jr. And Sebastian Buemi takes the lead in Argentina. Look at Oliver Turvey up the inside and he gets it job done on the brakes. The grass is in trouble here. Here comes Nico Prost up the inside into turn four, and he's got the job done. Prost locks oh. up. He's going all locked in. A little bit close, just about makes it out. And goodness me, Degrassi right out in front of Nelson Piquet. Congrats, good job. Pachito, as he's known. Look at that, go. on their feet. Oh, oh look at these two. The, the two Dragon Racing Faraday Future cars. What was that for work? Oh, and in the wall is Sam Bird. Bird yeah. Sebastian Buemi, he is the man to take a hat-trick of Formula E wins. That was a clinic on how to do it right there. Super job, super job. Yes, yes, yes. So Sebastian Buemi sustains his place at the top of the leaderboard. And talking of sustainability, FE's very own CEO recently told a world audience what he thinks is the solution to protecting our futures. A TED Talk or a TEDx in this case is a great initiative that started many years ago for people to share ideas. When I was seven years old, I had a passion. Planets, stars, rockets, science. The idea of this, this TED Talk happened in uh, Greenland when we were there filming the, the Project Ice with a race car in the, in, the, in the Arctic Cup. There I am, a huge carpet of ice in front of me, all the way to the North Pole. When I got there that morning, everything was white, cold, frozen. Now, 2 p.m., I have streams of water just running down towards the sea. The whole place is melting. And then that made me ask myself a question of how long has it taken for us to get to this level of, you know, of destruction of our planet and of the, of the climate. It's just a little bit over 200 years since the Industrial Revolution. We've been pumping all these greenhouse gases, CO2, into the atmosphere. I'm going to condense the 6.4 billion years of the life of Earth into one year. Let's call it the Earth year. And then I'm going to see how much 200 years represent into that year. We have been polluting for two seconds. The destructive two seconds. I wanted to focus on the real dangers that we have today here on Earth, on our planet. 
about environment sustainability and how that is linked with the long-term future of humans. The sun is going to continue reasonably stable for another five to six billion years, so another Earth year and a bit. But then it will use all the hydrogen it, it uh, is burning and will start growing. It will engulf Mercury, Venus, and very likely the Earth. Well, the solution is that we need, we need to figure out a way to travel from star to star. That's the only way where we will be able to go and live in other planets. Since we launched the Kepler telescope a few years ago, we've discovered over a thousand exoplanets on a very small window of the sky. We've even discovered a planet that scientists call Earth 2.0, because it looks so much like Earth. The problem with that planet is that if we were able to travel at the speed of light, it would take us 1,400 years just to get there. It has to be possible to break the speed of light. We don't know how today, but things go very fast. So what we have to do is try. Many things that today are possible, centuries or even decades ago, were unthinkable. We did break the speed of sound, we have antibiotics, we fly in planes, we've been to the moon. But the problem is we may be running out of time because we are, dis we are destroying Earth. Look what we've done in two seconds. What are we gonna do in the next two seconds? If we continue like we're going, we're not gonna last a minute in this planet. The first thing we need to do is to take care of the environment, and every single person can do that by, you know, your normal habits of every day. Turn off a light, use solar energy, use electric cars. That's how we will gain time on Earth so we can really figure out how to go to other planets. I was there in the Arctic. I could see it everywhere. We need to take action now. Well, there you have it. You heard it here first. I'll leave you to think about that for a few minutes, but when we come back, still all this to come. Getting a nose job with Tachita, taking a sneak peek at the New York circuit, and meeting the Formula E engineers of tomorrow. Here on the wall, we have a collection of Formula Student cars from 2003 all the way up to 2012. We're here in Argentina as Formula E returns to one of its most popular locations. And while street racing is still relatively new to these parts, there is one sport and one team in particular who are the heartbeat of the city. No surprise then that the boys from Jaguar couldn't resist the chance to visit Boca Juniors and have a kickabout with two of the team stars. Did he pull the hammy there, Miss? <laughs> There was even time for a best of three penalty shootout. Yeah, no, good luck. Best of luck. Oh. Well, Mitch, you, should, you got this one, Mitch. This is definitely for you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. No. One goal apiece with one strike each left to come. The pressure on then for Adam Carroll. No! <laughs> so, a win for Mitch Evans, but I wouldn't suggest switching sports just yet. Now let's switch from South America to North America. Next up on the FE calendar is Mexico. But towards the climax of the season, we head to New York. And if you've ever wondered how a course is planned out, wonder no more. I'm at the Brooklyn Cruise Terminal, which will be the home for Formula E when they come here in June. I'm about to meet up with Mike Hooper, who the guys are working with Formula E to put this event on. We'll have a quick look around and do a site visit and plan where all the TV cameras are going to go. And that's why I just want to make sure that with this blank canvas, we take in all these key landmarks. Wow. We want to have like we want to have Manhattan in the background and the cars coming towards the camera and the cameras holding there and you've got the cars in the foreground. So this is now the start straight, hairpin at the end, and back down again. You get this great straightaway that comes right along the waterfront. 
that's got the backdrops to it. Yeah, it's, it's really cool spot. This is turns two and three. So the plan will be is to have a drone like low in this dead zone here to start low, and then it'll just crane up and reveal the skyline. It's a first for us all, isn't it? You know, coming here for a street race in New York. It's the the easiest way we explain it is it's the first FIA sanctioned race in New York City in modern history. You couldn't race in Manhattan, right? Because all the buildings are so tall, all you'd get are shots of just the lower part of the buildings, and you Correct. really wouldn't get it, right? No, no, no good point. Uh, so this, you've got this amazing backdrop of lower Manhattan, you've got the Statue of Liberty. Everything that you could really ask for in a New York race, you've got available to you as a backdrop. This corner is here. This is now turn number four. So I think the corner is, they come in from there, don't they? It's turn four now, and away. You've got the e-village, um, we're working through what our on-site dining and entertainment options are those. But because we're here in Red Hook and we've got so many good local businesses and restaurants and shops and those type of things, we're already talking about how do we integrate them into the event. That's a nice little track, it's compact, it's there right on the waterfront. This neighborhood too is a young neighborhood, right? Interested in new technology, interested in those pieces. So I think there's, that's why there's an additional level of interest in this event is the technology side of it. It's a really good neighborhood for us to be in because it fits what they're doing out here. Just come to the end of the site visit here in New York. Fun circuit for the drivers, a few overtaking spots. Uh, the city themselves have got a bit of work to do, but I'm sure they'll be ready uh, in time for June. But the most important thing I need to make sure is we get that backdrop in plenty of the shots. Argentina, we've seen the race from Next TV's perspective. Now let's go behind the scenes with Team Tachita. Uh, here we are, guys, with my mechanics ready to make a pit stop change uh, for changing the nose. Uh, so let's go, guys. Pretty good, isn't it? So Tom, as a mechanic, I've just seen you change the nose there pretty quick, I have to say. What is the difficulty, especially during a race, to do this slick and fast? Uh, firstly, the weather. Obviously, it's red hot, sweating, hot and sweaty hands. The wheels are really hot, burning legs, burning hands. And it looked pretty quick, Joe. Is it, it seems like a really like well-oiled machine with, with the team, like you have to all know what you're doing. Normally in a race situation, he'll, hit, he'll probably break his nose just around the corner and we'll all be watching the TV. Then you've got to grab your nose. Yes, it'll be ready at the front and you'll have your tools ready, but in the heat at the moment, you know, things can go wrong. You'll be still in the wrong place. You don't know where he's going to stop because he'll be angry. But that, that's why we do so much practice. Jean, that looked pretty quick. Were you impressed with that? Yeah, hopefully. I mean, uh, we never have to use that in the race, but just in case, I can say that the mechanics are ready. And, uh, you know, it's like going to an exam at school. Yeah, you have to learn absolutely everything, and the more things you, uh, you have, uh, you know, that you can manage, uh, the better you feel in your mind, and it's important for the mechanics to, to know that anything that can happen in the race, they can manage it. What else do you practice normally? Uh, tire changes. Yeah. Um, obviously, if you damage the front wing, there's a fair chance you can get a puncture as well. And then obviously the driver, no other single seat at championship, you have to change the driver. So legs going everywhere, you know, you need to start getting in the radio, lines and all that stuff. Seat belts. Belts yeah. that are all between the legs, yeah, it, it can get, um, I can get personal as well, so yeah. It's good. <laughs> get, get to know your driver. <laughs> do you have a laugh though when you're all together? Yeah, yeah. it's good, it's good fun. Yeah. We have a laugh, a lot of banter. Well, I'll let you guys get back to what you were doing. Cheers, we heard you guys were going to help us out because you've taken our time. Right? Oh. We've lost probably half an hour. We heard yeah, we about that. Half half um, half. I don't have the gloves, so I can't. We have, we have spare yeah, gloves. These are actually gloves, from yeah. Grip, so. Yeah, um, sorry guys, <laughs> gotta get off. From the guys currently plying their trade in Formula E, let's turn our attention to a group of young engineers who would love to follow in their footsteps. We're switching continents for a moment to introduce Team Delft. Delft is a small town in the Netherlands between The Hague and Rotterdam. We're a, a team based in Delft that every year builds a Formula-style race car for the Formula Student Competition. This year we are again designing a Formula Student car, uh, which means building a small uh, open-wheeled, open-cockpit car uh, that can go incredibly fast. I used to be karting. Karts are already really fast, but having this car with insane power-to-weight ratio is just mind-blowing. The first time I drove it, like my, my brains were still a few corners behind. 
So the competition started in the 80s um, as a purely combustion-based competition. As we moved on into the 2010s, um, they decided to release a rule set for electric vehicles. What the electric drive really offers us to do is do something uh, different to really look at the car from a purely functional perspective again. The difference between combustion and electric is the combustion is in a way much simpler. Uh, it's very straightforward to drive. With the electric one you have your instant torque, instant response, yeah, it just reacts really fast. If you look at a traditional combustion car, you know that yes, there is going to be an engine at the front or somewhere in the middle or somewhere in the back. Uh, but what we can do with electricity is say, hmm, the motors, we can basically put that anywhere. So for our cars, we decided to put those in the wheels, for example. Here on the wall, we have our collection of Formula Student cars from 2003 all the way up to 2012. And right over here, you can see our 2015 car. This is our last World Championship winner at Formula Student Germany. And it was a quite revolutionary car for the way it used its inner wheel. For the past few years, Formula Student cars have dominated um, the world record from 0 to 100 km per hour. So electric cars accelerate really, really quick, faster than Formula One cars. In 2013, we set the record at uh, 2.15 seconds, I believe it was. And since then, Stuttgart and Zurich have actually taken it all the way down to one and a half seconds. There is rivalry, of course, but it's in a very positive way. The fact that the teams from all around the world are super, super enthusiastic about getting to know each other better. It's not a part of our degree. We do it purely for the love of it. It's such an exciting project. Once you see um, what the previous car can do, you really just want to do one thing and that's do it even better. So some names to look out for there and how they'd love to design a car for this guy. Time to put the defending champ under the spotlight. Name? Sebastian. Age? 28. Team? Renault Idams. Favourite animal? Cat. Your childhood ambition? Formula One driver. Sporting hero? Roger Federer. Your toughest opponent? Lucas. Your greatest strength? Never give up. Your worst habit? Uh, maybe too emotional. Your favourite film? Seven. Which superhero would you be? Batman. He has a good car. <laughs> favourite singer or band? Um, the Beatles. Do you have a best dance move? No. Are you sure? 100%. Do you have any fears or phobias, like spiders or anything like that? Sharks. <laughs> any hidden talents? I can play ping pong, but I'm not sure it's really a talent. And Sebastian Buemi starts our social roundup as he pays tribute to his team for the perfect start to the season. Despite fame and fortune, the Amlin Andretti boys still get excited to see themselves on the big screen. Loic Duval applauds the bravery of this four-legged track intruder. And local fan Daniela Montesano shows Jose Maria Lopez that despite his frustration on home soil, he will always be her hero. But the big news during the rounds is that former F1 driver Esteban Gutierrez will make his FE debut for Tachita in Mexico, replacing Marcin Hua for the rest of the season. Please keep those tweets coming at FIA Formula E. So that's it from Argentina, where Sebastian Buemi has signed his name on the streets of Buenos Aires. We'll see if you can follow up this form when we return next time in Mexico for Race 4. Bye for now.